<laughs> the timer. <laughs> um, one of the hypotheses that inform the imagined timeline that we've constructed for this year's Global Art Forum is one about how crucial the 1970s have been to the formation of today's landscape, uh, both culturally and politically. In previous sessions, yesterday and also uh, last weekend in Doha, we explored, uh, for instance, Doha's spaceship architecture of the 70s, as well as yesterday, Dubai's urban planning of the 70s. Um, today's session will sort of take us to other geographies and expand this exploration of the 70s and take us in particular to uh, Chile, to Iran, to Greece. The session will be hosted by Oscar Guardiola Rivera. He, um, he was here at the Global Art Forum last year uh, and he was writing a book and he had just lost two chapters of the book and it, there was something of a panicky moment going on there. Since then, the book has been published to great acclaim and it's called Story of a Death Foretold, The Coup Against Salvador Allende, 11 September 1973. Mm -hmm. And this book in particular has been one of the sort of entry points for us into the, this exploration of the 70s as a decade and as an important decade. He is joined by Marina Fokidis, uh, from Greece. She's an independent curator and writer. She curated the Greek pavilion at the latest um, Venice Biennial. She also curated the third Thessaloniki Biennial in 2011. And she is the founder and artistic director of Kunsthalle Athena. Um, we also have Tirdad Zolgadr with us. He is also a curator. He um, as a curator, he's worked in many different places, here in Dubai, in Sharjah, in Tehran, in New York, and in elsewhere. He, this year, is leading the Forum Fellows program as part of the Global Art Forum and of Art Dubai. And he is also a writer, a novelist in particular, and the title of his novel, To Come, is Headbanger. And I don't know if it has anything to do with the 70s at all. Great. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, it's an absolute pleasure to be here, to be back here, but uh, uh, the first thing that I have to do is to congratulate you. You are the strong ones. You are the ones who endured uh, Schumann's version of uh, a marathon slash TV talk show till the very end. Uh, as you will see, you will be given the best the best part of the show in the day. But also, you must be incredibly tired because uh, you have been sitting without a back support, many of you, for quite some time. So let me channel my inner Latin American persona and uh, invite you to stand up. Come on, stand up. Don't worry, I'm not going to teach you to do salsa. I'll do that <laughs> afterwards. What I want to do, though, is uh, uh, to uh, perform a little uh, experiment. It's a visual experiment uh, that I have performed before in Portugal, in Brazil, and in, in other places, and which is accompanied by uh, uh, that uh, very minimalist version of uh, a, a bunch of visuals that I'm going to show you in the next uh, five to seven minutes. Uh, and uh, in a way, this will be our declaration about uh, what uh, history is or us. I would prefer what uh, history shouldn't be. Uh, this is a, an experiment on uh, why we should forget uh, history, uh, capital H, that is to say, monumental history. Now, what I want you to do is to uh, uh, draw uh, a line with your index, just like that. Extend your right hand and your arm, front of your chest, that's brilliant. Now go like that. Exactly, you don't have to kill anyone, don't worry. But uh, now I want you to do what Arab navigators of uh, the 15th century and uh, Hollywood directors of the 21st century do. Earth, that is to say, the roundness of a space and time, 
remember your Einstein, becomes flattened, projected onto a bi-dimensional screen, which you just uh, uh, made with your fingers. This is what Aram the trick that the optical trick that Aram navigators used in order to uh, navigate in the open sea was taken up by Italian painters in the 16th century, particularly Paolo Uccello, who uh, very quickly noticed that, of course, if you, if you flatten the, the surface once, you can do so twice, and you produce the line of the horizon. Uccello uh, copied Arab navigators and uh, used their invention to invent what in uh, modern art history is known as perspectiva, perspective. But of course, the line of the horizon, uh, drawn in this manner, also means that you can divide the circle of the earth, yes, go ahead, <laughs> the circumference of the earth, you can divide it into two, north and south. When you divide it into two, you have north and south. You also have the inside, those of us this side of the dividing line and those over there on the other side of the dividing line. When you create an inside and an outside, you invent another very important thing for modern, for modern times, both in art and in philosophy. You invent identity. Those of us on the others on this side of the line, those are us, a kinship. We can recognize one another. Uh, what they were talking about in the previous uh, talk. Those on the other side, Kafir, <laughs> barbarians, those who we cannot recognize, us and them. That very small, uh, uh, very basic, now you can sit down, <laughs> that very basic uh, dualism has marked, uh, in fact, defined the way in which uh, uh, history, most of history, uh, is written. Uh, narrativized. Notice that most, uh, in most uh, historical books, those that write uh, history with uh, a capital M, the kinds of books that you find there, you know, the kinds of books that you shouldn't read, although actually uh, I would uh, make an exception for, for two books over there. Uh, one is a really brilliant book that is on the, uh, you can see uh, on the first line, you know, the second from left to, uh, to right, that one, yes and the one behind it, uh, William's Return of the King. Brilliant books, you should read them. All the others, forget about them. All the others are history with a capital M, which is always inevitably written with a chronological, a linear chronological uh, framework. And that chronological framework also means that you will always find in those histories, us and them. And us, inevitably, are the good guys. Them, the bad guys. And of course, history then is flattened. And it becomes something very, very simple. How us, the good ones, can triumph at the end of history, uh, by which we mean either them convert to our values, or go somewhere else, or else, ah, sorry, they might face extinction. Those, uh, those two basic dualisms are uh, what mark uh, most of our understandings of history. Uh, and uh, you see them, you see them uh, uh, pretty much everywhere these days. Uh, because we have also interiorized them to the extent that uh, uh, even when we are going to refer as uh, uh, it was... Uh, as uh, Panjak uh, Mishra did this morning in the Gulf News while uh, referring to uh, the return of the, of the Eurasian fantasy, uh, all, the, all the stuff that is happening in, uh, in Crimea, uh, he referred how a friend of his in Germany uh, described the situation uh, with this phrase. Well, you see, the Russians they might need another century to become Europeans. Uh, and the idea, of course, is that because they are uh, over there, uh, they will take some time uh, to uh, walk 
along the line of history, which some of us have already walked, uh, some of us who have already entered uh, what some might call the promised land, which in our, economic, uh, in, in, in our economics language is the developed countries, uh, which supposedly show to all the other countries an image of their own future. But that understanding has been challenged uh, from the very outset, particularly in the 1970s. There we go. By those guys and uh, those ladies. Notice terribly that the lady is at the back. It's a shame because in my book, she is the protagonist. She's in between Salvador Allende and Jose Marti here on the, on the left-hand side of uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the image. Her name is Blanca Luz Brum. She was a poet. She was an incredible, an incredible woman, a uh, Uruguayan poet. She was born to escape. When she was 17 years of age, she escaped on a motorbike uh, with uh, a uh, Peruvian poet, ended up in Peru. Over there, she uh, launched a uh, journal together with Jose Carlos Mariategui, who uh, attended the second coming turn with Emin Roy and uh, Sultan Galiev and uh, is uh, among those responsible for uh, the emergence of another understanding of history, which uh, Okwe uh, just uh, uh, invoked while talking to Hans Ulrich about the crucial importance of the Bandung Conference, of the emergence of uh, uh, the voice of the third world in the 1970s. What happens with, when history is uh, written in a linear manner and with a basic dualism is that the third term is always excluded, is always forgotten. Those guys are forgotten. The Bandung Conference is forgotten. The uh, 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 people in Colombia forget where the term cafre or kafir comes from. Uh, and, uh, and that's when history, of course, uh, which I will call minor history, history with a, uh, a small h becomes much more interesting. That's Paolo Cello. There you see the line of the horizon, which give you history in a stages, as if it were an evolution, the very idea of progress. And there, another protagonist of uh, uh, my story of death foretold in Chile in 1973, Salvador Allende, a well-known figure. Uh, but in this particular photograph, he is wearing uh, the colors of another kind of narrative, another bunch of symbols, uh, the symbols of arcana and mystery, which a Chilean poet and cinematographer at the time, Alejandro Jodorowsky, someone that both Shimon and I really like very much. He makes really good films uh, and uh, used to take really great drugs. Uh, I didn't say that. Uh, he took all that imagery and produced a, a very different uh, narrative. A narrative uh, taking place after the events of 11 September 1973, when the good guys decided that the bad guys, that is to say, Allende and uh, the voices of the third world in Chile should be obliterated. They exactly did that with the help of some hawker hunter jets like the one you see in that photograph, uh, uh, balked to the British. Which brought to Chile that very recognizable figure of the Arcana, reinterpreted by Jodorowsky. What is history? Uh, Hans Ulrich in uh, the uh, uh, you know, one of these uh, wonderful uh, serpentine gallery marathons, the one that I liked the most of all I have attended, once invited two of my favorite writers, China Mieville and Ivan Calder Williams, to describe uh, their understanding of history and China and even evoked uh, an image, the image of Paul Clay's Angel of History, as uh, reinterpreted by the philosopher of history, Walter Benjamin. History with a capital H, the history that I had just described as a flattening of time and space, 
uh, turns out to be nothing more than an optical illusion. What it erases is that the fact that history is a piling of wreckage before the feet of an anguished angel, a pile of debris flying skywards. But, and with this, I will introduce my other two speakers. It so happens that nowadays we cannot see history from the perspective of the angel. Rather, as the visual theorist Hito Steyer puts it, we're no longer staring at the wreckage from the point of view of Benjamin's shell-shocked angel. We are the debris. History, as written and told from the perspective of us as debris, is what we in this panel uh, would like to introduce. And uh, perhaps, just as we persuaded you to stand up and play a little bit with us, we can also persuade you to go and read write, portray, and make that other kind of history, minor history. Let me invite uh, uh, my first speaker to my left, Marina, to tell us her version of this uh, uh, history in relation to the events that took place in the short 1970s in Greece. Thank you very much. Is it, Is it working? It's working? All right. Well, it's very hard to follow you because you <laughs> created wonderful history, uh, minor history, narrative, but I'll try my best. Um, in my case, we will see a little bit um, of um, real events that happened in Greece uh, in the short 70s that start in the 40s, as we will see from uh, the presentation. Um, is it on? Yeah. And um, just to thank Sumon and everybody for having me here. Sorry, if Marina, can you make sure your mic is on? I think it's on, yeah? No, it's not. Ah, all right. All right. For having me here, uh, not so much for speaking about Greece, because that's, um, I'm happy to be squeezed be between the two divas here, as we were discussing before. Greece is always come squeezed. But uh, mostly for hearing um, all these things, uh, this one day and a half that made me rethought a bit about uh, are Western assumptions on other places that are not under this Western dominant uh, thought. Uh, as being Greece, Greek right now, um, I don't know if you hear, it's like the, we are the irresponsible uh, people of Europe. We are the corner of, um, non, the non-reliable corner of uh, European Union. You're kafir. Yes, you became exactly. Latin Americans, <laughs> the economy, Yeah, exactly. Uh, it's funny um, because also we have a little bit, we created a little bit of uh, attention to uh, contemporary artists, but it's very funny on thinking about that, how they um, deal with it. Like some months ago, a very known uh, famous artist came to give a talk in, in, in Greece. And it's very funny to see how these artists make a museum career out of like appropriating um, exotic realities for themselves while being localities, while being somewhere else. So once she arrived in Greece, the first thing you saw in her Facebook was, hey guys, for you in Greece or for anybody that, uh, or for Greeks, is there anything, uh, any interesting riots that I could attend? Um, this was something like, uh, <laughs> What before was, are there any, any interesting um, galleries that I could go and it's in the border of vulgarity. So I understand very, good, very much what this sort of assumption can be. I said to the previous slide something like history is a nostalgia. It's, it's because Greeks, we always like to bring up the Greek words. So nostalgia is uh, the pain for, um, uh, the pain, algos in Greece, for nostos, which is remembering. It was invented in the 17th century uh, as a pathology, as it was observed initially to uh, Swiss uh, mercenaries after long hours in the military duty. Effects were melancholia, depression, anorexia, and eventually suicide. Today, nostalgia is um, a universal emotion. Rapid socioeconomical um, uh, and technological tr transformation made one feel foreign to its own world. I mean, we grow up in a world uh, or we, we, we come in a world that we don't recognize while we're growing up because things are changing so fast. Um, so homecoming is the quest. But my question is, um, 
what kind of homecoming is this? Is it a homecoming to a dysfunctional family, to a destructive home? Is there an alternative, somewhere else to go? For the sake of this retromania, I'm gonna do a very quick um, or jog very fast through several images uh, of artists and, and of ephemera uh, about Greece. Uh, this is by no means a historical um, um, description of the left or the right or of Greece. I'm not a historian, and this is just some loose images, somehow um, summarizing art and pol politics as performances, performances of different regimes. Uh, the image we have right now is by an artist called Sotiris Sorogas in the 70s. It was a, a painting um, triptych. And uh, although it was done in the 70s, it depicts symbolically a, a character uh, that was called Beloyanis and used to be always with this um, carnation in his um, jacket, something like your red uh, uh, thing here. It's not Oscar. And so this character, uh, Beloyanis, was killed uh, in the, just in the, in the civil world, uh, wars, accused. It, he was death sentenced as a communist. Uh, despite the help of his intellectual friends from all over the world and the rights um, uh, and the human rights, I mean, his friends were Picasso, Charlie Chaplin, he was still. So then he was adopted, the, the carnation, the red carnation was adopted by the left as a symbol of freedom. Also, this image refers to the Rebetico uh, music um, players Rebe and to the exchange of population more, more than anything because this was in the 20s when Greeks had to leave Turkey as a, um, an effect of the Lausanne Treaty and come to Greece. Um, I grew up in a very, I mean, meanwhile, Greece uh, history, and, and Greece is a very quiet and beautiful place, as uh, some of you might have been there. I grew up in a very protected environment, um, in a very residential area, going to an okay school or good school. Everything was calm there and uh, beautiful, but we always knew that something is, I mean, I always felt like most of us that something was wrong. Then the story started unfolding, unfolding, unfolding in front of me when I heard about my dad that was sentenced um, to death, but finally he did 10 years in prison as a communist. And the only thing I knew is that he left his university to fight for freedom with the allies in Libya, or my grandparents that was constantly mourning because they had to leave Turkey in the 30s and come to Greece as, as a result of this uh, exchange of population plan, or the change of our history books in school. It was, I think, in, during my schooling time, maybe four times, and each book was canceling what the previous history book was saying. And also, I was brought up with the fables of Aesop, a Greek ancient uh, sort of uh, folk philosopher, and uh, Nazratin Hoja, for those of you you know, which is like um, um, a satirical Sufi from Turkey, although Turkish, Turkey was our enemy. Um, the images you see now are the freedom fighters during the civil war. The civil war happened in Greece just, um, it was between the 43 and 49, 44 or 43. It happened just after the world war when Greece was completely wrecked economically and socially and everything, but we keep fighting each other, uh, the left and the right. The left um, completely adopted and performed the Soviet, although it was irrelevant for the Greek reality. At the same time, the Marshall Plan was helping Greece, and one of the things they did to, to stand up economically was giving radios to the periphery, but just to hear what was happening in their villages, which was like lots of dead people, Greeks killing Greeks for all these years. Here we have um, an image by a wood engraving by an artist in 1949. What you see, it's a very vulgar uh, Greek gesture, also a very common Greek gesture. It means to your face. It means you're completely dumb. We still do it in the car, and, uh, but it's very strong, it's an anathema. And he did this drawing, it's an outsider art, uh, this engraving as a result to the war, to both of them, because nobody could take a position if the, you know, between the fascism and the communist. At the same time, we have um, Glezos and Sandas, two students that in 1941 went up and took down the flag, the flag of Nazis from Parthenon with the risk of their own life. Here I have to say that um, um, as Serre, uh, Michel Serre, in he, one of his last books uh, called The Town de Crise, 
after the time of the series, the times of series, the times of crisis, he argues that um, uh, the most important division we can do right now is between the soft and the hard gestures, the, the, between the soft and the hard um, revolutions. And this is important to be made. He also argues that writing, writing typography and reproduction and computer in our days, um, all these have been created a big turbulence and have saved conventions as much as hard changes have, like um, industry and um, nuclear bombs and all this. He thinks that um, the way to democracy is the access and the active intervention, as simple as that. And we all know how we can have access and single in the, in, in the active intervention and somehow um, create our own fates through uh, that. So I'm showing you some hard and soft gestures. Um, next slide is the same two men after some years in front uh, of the Parthenon. The man on the right, which is Gletschus, made a very, um, he became a deputy in several political parties and had a, a brilliant um, political career. 1944, we have a poet, um, sort of outsider poet, uh, called Yorgos Macris. He was one of those that they were called the um, saboteur of antiquity. And in that period of Greece, that national identity was very important. He um, made the proclamation about the bombing of the Parthenon. It was a very strong gesture, never written in a history book at that period of time. And um, he didn't make actually a political career, but he committed suicide later on, uh, like many Greek intellectuals. In the 50s, and uh, following, this is the performance of existentialism in Greece. Uh, following this, like very, we are under democracy, but we still have a very conservative way of uh, being and behaving and very conservative politics. So in that uh, hat, which is the hat of a shoemaker called Simos, and also uh, then he became a tent maker for balconies, the Greek existentialism starts existing. This is in a way the first art center of Greece or the first Kunsthalle. And what people did there is that they gathered, they danced, they made art. But three years after, they closed this because the police confiscated some love letters <laughs> written to one another and they thought that uh, this kind of free love uh, is completely illegal and very dangerous. Simos then photographed himself again in front of the Parthenon and decided to live with this car and went and lived in Paris. In the 50s, around the same time, we have what they call the Teddy Boys Public Assault. And this was youth that they were, they, they found another soft gesture of uh, revolution and that was they would throw yogurts uh, in whatever they thought it was unjust, uh, it was um, uh, not um, uh, of their own opinion. Like for example, they would throw yogurts to American cars or to organization that mistreated women or to everything that they thought it's not quite good. So it was like the yogurt. Uh, war. Have you heard of the Greek yogurt? We have a lot, <laughs> you know. And uh, it's very funny because in Germany they, they, it exists a yogurt that it's called Elinas, which is the Greek. So I think they would be very happy to have a tool like that in their hands. Well, the police then decided to do these public assaults. Um, they would take this youth, these young people, they would cut the hair in that uh, haircut you see there, uh, in public, in the streets, and there, and he's wearing this kind of uh, tag that says, I'm very, I, I disobeyed, I'm a teddy boy. At the same time, in the beginning of 60s, 60s we have the first union of Russell in Greece, and they're trying to organize um, a, world, a walk for peace. Uh, we are under democracy again, but no, the walk of peace cannot happen because the police uh, blocks the people you're not allowing the democratic Greece to do a walk of peace. I mean, the idea was that they would start from the center of Greece, or of Athens, and they would go to Marathonas where there is a um, sort of monument for victory. One man, uh, Gregorios Lambrakis, which was a um, uh, deputy at that time, uh, found a way. He went through all the blocks because he, was, he had asylum as a politician by his car and his wife, and when, so they couldn't stop him really, and when he arrived near the monument that was the meeting for the end, he went out of the, he stepped out of the car and he had this banner that says Greece with a peace sign. 
Of course, they arrested him, but they couldn't really put him in jail because he was a politician. So, so what they do is they put him in these car jails going around uh, for two days because he couldn't be arrested in Greek ground. Three months after that, he dies mysteriously. And um, uh, the, the, general, the international organization of students with Russell comes to his funeral. We are approaching the 70s, I mean, early, uh, late 60s. This is two days before the coup d'etat we had in Greece, which was between uh, 67 and 74. And um, it's, this is a sort of funny incident. I'm okay with time or not? Uh. Okay, so this is a Rolling Stones concert where I told you about the carnation in the very beginning. So in that um, concert, the, the, uh, the, the youth is giving to Mick Jagger a bouquet of red carnations. Mick Jagger is throwing that back to the audience and then immediately everybody gets arrested, Mick Jagger including, and being beaten because the police says this is an action of communism. Coup d'etat a design between like uh, our colonel, the Greek, um, the Greek people under him, the imperialists, and uh, the Marvel, co the Superman caricature is the, the left. Then several performances, like these are festivities of the Kunda, these are students occupying universities writing the word freedom, <coughs> until we arrive to the incident of the three days occupation from the university that uh, unfortunately um, the military kunda sends um, a tank and kills people. This is the kind of art that is producing during that time. I won't go in details about it because I don't have that much time, but you see the this is Blasis Cañaris, he died, you see the carnation being uh, brought back. Uh, artists were trying to get over the censorship at that time, so we have another artist, Yorgos Lazogas, that just saw this gas stove that is very common in Greece because we make the Greek coffee in there. Uh, so it went by the police censorship. They weren't that clever, but it's also the bomb that the rioters use. Other kind of work around that time. This is a, a puppet theater, the theater of Hitler, as it was called. And we arrive to the end, to this sort of um, funny incident, incident, to a different, let's say, kind of um, narrative of revolution, one that I think it's kind of, uh, it's very significant, but it, it wasn't discussed so uh, much in Greece because it didn't have any hazards. Uh, in 1969, the film you see in the two screens um, the, is the colonel, uh, Yorgos Papadopoulos, that was uh, the, the chief of the coup d'etat. Uh, decided to do a youth festival because he thought that that's a way to convince uh, people over his uh, political coup d'etat. Of course, it was not so hard to do and have a lot of people around him because, of course, they went to all villages and they obliged people to come to this festivity. So everybody was there and everything was going fine. He was giving his speeches until the last minutes that, or like, when, no, not the last minutes, when he started really saying about his speech that the crowds, the youth, started to laugh frantically. It was like really crazy. They started to laugh so hard that he couldn't really continue speaking. This was the first really real and significant protest against the coup d'etat, and from there they understood that there will be a bad end. It was maybe not something that was pre-agreed, uh, but when the crowd start laughing, then everybody understood. I don't know if we can have, can we have the sound or we, uh, we move forward? I think it's better we... Okay, we move forward. It's okay. It's, yeah. yeah. See that? Thank you, Marina. Thanks, um, Oscar and Omar, for the, for the introductions, and Shumon for the invitation. Um, I've, uh, I've lived off and on in Tehran uh, since the late 90s, which is why uh, Shumon suggested that I speak about the 70s from an 
a Tehran perspective, and I tried to summarize two angles that I thought would be the most um, interesting to this conversation here. Uh, one being the violent plight of the Iranian left, because I knew that uh, this is uh, research that both Marina and Oscar are uh, pursuing in other contexts, uh, but also uh, the foundation of the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in uh, the mid-70s in Tehran, um, which is research that I've been looking into for a while and that I've presented in other contexts and that I'll be really condensing into a very brief presentation today. Um, in some ways, those two histories are related, in some ways not. So, um, that um, slide, is it still on? So to um, situate my own uh, background in Tehran, that um, slide is, uh, it's basically an advertisement for our family restaurant in the 70s, um, which is kind of endearing, but it's a, a mark of pride. And um, the, the Zolrad family was neither particularly wealthy nor particularly monarchist, but with their... Um, eccentric cosmopolitan lifestyle that gravitated around this restaurant, they definitely did uh, profit from the razzmatazz of the Shah's 1970s and they were not complaining. Very recently, I met a regular patron of this restaurant. Um, I found out by coincidence that he frequented the place and uh, we can call him Gol Muhammad. And he was a member of a Maoist faction in the 70s and he told me that he actually spent uh, many nights trying very hard to get as drunk as possible at the family, at our family establishment. Not for the fun of it, but because uh, many of his comrades had opted for armed resistance um, and were being uh, picked off and uh, shot one by one as they were pursuing armed struggle in the forests of northern Iran. And he had backed out and he was finding it very hard to deal with the guilt of survival. He told me a lot of colorful anecdotes, some of which were familiar, some not, about uh, various factions. For example, the Marxist, uh, Islamist, is Islamic Marxists were pushing for more guns and less theory, the Trotskists for less guns and more theory, the Maoists for more guns and more theory, many social democrats and Stalinists alike for less guns and less theory both. Um, and so on and so forth. And the factionalism was one of the reasons for the demise of the left, but it wasn't the, other, the only. The other was a systematic campaign of persecution um, on behalf of the Shah's regime, which led to uh, many arrests and executions over the course of the 1970s um, and had a continuation after the revolution and uh, culminated in a, in a in the physical annihilation of the Iranian left in the late 1980s uh, during a famous bloodbath in the early 1989. Um, obviously, this is part of a wider pattern that unfolded in many other places, and sometimes it's tempting to speculate what, would ha have, what the world would look like if this uh, physical annihilation of the most dedicated uh, leftist activists had not occurred. Um, the Shah had a uh, ambitious cultural agenda too, he and his wife. Um, it was the early 1970s when Empress Farah took an interest in art and announced the need for a public art museum. She took an interest in a slump in art market prices in, uh, world, in the world um, and invested very swiftly in uh, scores of weathered New York galleries and saved them from bankruptcy. And her collection quickly grew to include a spectacular range of Western canon Meisterwerke, which are now, according to the Guardian newspaper, worth nearly four billion US dollars. The 5,000 square meter museum is on inaugurated in summer 77 with a solo show by David Hockney. The architecture is both elegant and bewildering. Um, it consists of these polycircular uh, trajectories that sometimes lead underground, sometimes into these uh, foyers, uh, sometimes offering views of the spectacular uh, 7,000 square meter park 
and in a style that is characteristic of the time, the edifice combines stark modernist architecture with localist elements, localist flair. Um, it's interesting to note that back in the 70s, uh, this museum um, was in a similar, it's widely called the Musée, uh, was in a similar situation to the Guggenheim Abu Dhabi today, only in the sense that it was scrambling to piece together a collection at breakneck speed, um, which means that um, artists at the time would have had leverage. Um, this is what allows uh, the Gulf labor campaign today, for example, to be so vocal. Uh, given that the Guggenheim needs the art and needs it now, the artists have a bargaining chip to bargain with. However, you'd be hard pressed to find an international artist in any field or genre from Peter Brook to Andy Warhol and beyond who had any qualms or reservations about working with the Persian monarchy. I did hear a rumor, it was only a rumor, that Lawrence Wiener had refused his invitation at the time, and at the first occasion, I did ask him if this was true. Wiener testily replied that he was 70 years old and didn't have the time to stand around and congratulate himself for his political credentials. Um, I assume that was a yes. Um, what is the museum today, 37 years later? You see collection shows, you see exhibitions of anything from calligraphy to landscape to portraiture by local artists that are fairly traditional in professional temperament. You also see curatorial scandals at every turn, a clunky glass wall separating you from the art, a soundtrack of classical concertos, jarring juxtapositions of artworks, and so on and so forth. Um, it's most widely known as a collection of modern art in a striking example of modernist architecture, but as the institutional epithet makes clear, it is devoted to the contemporary specifically. Even if it is a definition of the contemporary that strays from the transcontinental consensus of what contemporary means as in contemporary art. It seems that the musée, the musée is not uninterested in a transcontinental conversation, but it's also not in a hurry. It seems to insist on a conversation on its own terms. The contemporary to us, and I use this term very deliberately, is a certain mode of open-ended flux and exchange and interconnectivity of boundaries melting into air. So in the eyes of p people who use terms like contemporary in the way that I do, the musée is a frustrating, self-provincializing stick in the mud, a form of refusal. To be sure, the art world routinely celebrates refusals of all kinds. Um, every other art fair has panel discussions commending refusals. <laughs> but the refusal at play in the musée is nearly impossible to fit into an agenda, such as Art Dubai's or Frieze's or any other epicenter of the, local, of the contemporary art field. Today, I would say that every curator who flies into Tehran and walks into the place, including myself, fantasizes very fantastically about being empress of this musée. Oh, the things you could do. The bittersweet spleen of what may have been and never will be. Do the Iranians a favor and interconnect. Somebody call Schumann. But given what museums currently aspire to, um, I'm wondering whether the musée really is a curatorial disaster zone. I cannot think of a museum experience that is more distinctive, more pedagogical, and more haunting um, than the musée. It is even used as a social hangout and is widely referred to as an emblematic allegorical, allegorical tale of Iran at large. So it does everything that you wish a museum would do for you. It's the strongest kind of refusal because it doesn't need you. It doesn't particularly care. It's also a refusal in historical terms to return to the premise of today. It's indeed hard to find any traces whatsoever of the history I've been summarizing for you. Neither the hubris of contemporary art nor the political violence that it overshadowed in the mid 70s. In this way, it's a monument to the discontinuity of history, if you will. In other words, you can link the political violence of the 70s to the foundation of art in any way you like. You can talk fig leaves, epistemological thresholds, archive fever, what have you. The musée has other fish to fry. 
it's funny that this kind of discontinuity is actually unfamiliar and rare to us in contemporary art. <laughs> After all, we like to talk discontinuity. We've all read our Benjamin and our Foucault. But I sometimes wonder whether discontinuity, when it's uttered uh, within the field, is another way of simply saying complicated, indeterminate, circuitous, ultimately beyond bo borders, which is to say actually quite continuous in a way. The orthodox position in contemporary art is that history is indeed nonlinear, infinitely complex, inherently indeterminate on most levels, if not all. And this is indeed the mirror image of the idea of the contemporary that I was talking about, which is in turn indeterminate and infinitely complex, etc. This has led to the fact that we have an intuitive take on history that um, is a catechesis, which means that it's a metaphor that is not recognized as a metaphor. Um, it's so deeply institutionalized that it feels like the real thing. One sec. Um, it feels like epistemic home cooking. Um, so to, to um, respond to um, the quote by Hito Steyer, um, I very much identify with the project of seeing myself as part of the debris of history. It comes intuitively to me. It comes actually a little too intuitively to me. My, the thing that I'm trying to grapple with is what happens when um, that notion of history within the contemporary art field, contrary to more maybe uh, certain history departments, art history departments, journalism, etc., when in contemporary art it becomes hegemonic. Um, in a context like this, I think focusing on a decade like the 70s, as um, Schumann has proposed, can be helpful in a Bertolt Brechtian plump thought kind of way. Because decades are unapologetically metaphorical. They're in your face and they annoy and irritate in a way that spatial abstractions don't. Someone is always very quick to disagree with you as soon as you offer an abstraction in time as opposed to abstractions in space, which tend to go down pretty well. Um, so to use uh, Schumann's favorite term, they are polemical. And I'll end on that. But that's, that's probably the perfect uh, uh, point to enter that, because uh, it allows us to uh, uh, begin a short uh, discussion. Uh, what I find uh, most interesting about Hito Steyer's uh, uh, use of uh, both Benjamin and Adorno is that it ends precisely where you ended. Uh, Steyer end up, ends up telling us that uh, uh, if we want to uh, produce uh, art and or concepts uh, which uh, may be of worth in our uh, postmodern blah 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 time, then we should uh, uh, go over to the side of objects. A fond perdu is uh, 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 the uh, phrase that she uses and she's uh, uh, harking back that reference to uh, uh, Adorno and to this very idea that actually uh, we may be mistaken in uh, th uh, thinking that history is a sort of umbrella of, or over narrative where we can cramp all sorts of events. Uh, just as when we think that space is a background where things happen. That's not what space is. You put it very, uh, very correctly when, when, when you said actually the musée, the space, couldn't care less about you. That is more relevant to us nowadays because we have, I'm, I'm sure you have noticed, uh, ceased to be important as uh, biological and historical beings. We're now geological actors. And uh, uh, what we're doing is producing climate change and all these things, uh, a level of time that, that is uh, spatial, natural, geological. It has nothing to do with what we can do individually, refusal or not. So maybe, and this uh, 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 is a, a question to uh, both of you, uh, maybe what we are witnessing is precisely uh, the emergence of a history that goes beyond the nature, uh, uh, you know, the nature culture divide, and therefore also an art that has nothing to do with culture, or cultures in plural. I'd have to, I'd have to think about that last point. Um, that caught me by surprise. Um, but what I, what I could say in response is that um, yes, that sounds 
that sounds promising. And I think it reminds us of the fact that within contemporary art, we would actually be in a really favorable position to think about history in a way that um, both goes beyond what that generation of thinkers that we've been quoting uh, had tried to pull apart these very traditionalist notions of history, and yet not to uh, kick back and relax on uh, you know, those achievements and to think of, of history as this comfortable and catachristic uh, notion of, of non-linearity. Um, less than objects, I keep, I keep, yeah, the musée itself, I'm fascinated by institutions in this respect. Um, and I think that the talk, the documenta conversation was actually really emblematic in that way because it was, it's very rare for three, four curators to sit in a room and talk, think about history as diligently as that. It's very rare. <laughs> um, and I mean, I, I also blame myself. It just doesn't happen much. There's this ingrained um, amnesia, which is very much informed by a particular post-structuralist approach or a, a, an interpretation of a post-structuralist take on history. And then also by a professional survival instinct that kind of tells you that um, you, but you know, you, you better react against what is happening before you um, because what's coming after you will certainly not give a damn about you. So there's no time to th think about what came right before you. So there's this uh, systematic amnesia, this pragmatized amnesia um, that has become part of the curatorial profession. And then when you look at an institution like Documenta, suddenly it forces you to think in historical terms with a certain texture. Marina. Is it okay? Yeah. On? Okay. There is not much to uh, add in this. I mean, it was interesting what you said. And uh, again, in respect to Michel Serre, I would say that he was saying in the same book that I quoted something that um, when we talk today about the end of history, uh, it doesn't have to do only with this loop of end of too many histories, how many times we have uh, uh, talked about this, but also with the human genocide, which means that he thinks that it's so urgent to find an exodus because human and uh, planet is dying very fast. And that's what we are facing right now. So it's a very interesting... It would be very interesting to see what, uh, uh, you know, how we begin to express uh, uh, those new challenges, new, new in the real term. Again, I don't know if you have noticed, but one of the, uh, uh, these uh, badges that uh, Schumann is distributing around, in fact, the one that he has, uh, says... Uh, 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 meanwhile, Anthropocene. Oh, the, 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 no, I haven't seen this. The, uh, the reference behind that is the very idea, uh, which is becoming very uh, uh, enticing to many uh, geologists and, uh, f uh, and uh, physicists, is that we have uh, abandoned the, uh, uh, the, the previous geological era uh, because we have become a geological agents. And in that scale, human history doesn't matter as much. But also, the individualism that we celebrate in our everyday life also ceases to matter because climate warming is a thoroughly collective phenomenon. It's not something that you can solve solely by switching off your light or uh, you know, becoming more uh, conscientious about your, your uses of energy. It will, it will have to involve an equally collective uh, 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 response. And so uh, I wonder what kind of, uh, you know, how do, what do you see in uh, terms of uh, uh, emerging art or current art which uh, might begin to express uh, uh, the different quality of uh, uh, those challenges uh, which go even beyond the human in the sense precisely with Michel Serre uh, uh, proposes in, in his time of crisis. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Marina. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I don't see much. I, d I mean, I, I, d I don't think that there are um, proposals that could, um, uh, how to put it, uh, account for that level of complexity 
and of that level of urgency, which you, that picture which you're painting. Um, and I, I see that among artists and curators alike. Um, I think that the nature, because you, you use the term proposal, and the nature of a proposal within contemporary art right now um, is something which is so heavily invested within um, what I've been calling um, uh, indeterminacy, and I'm, I'm drawing on theorists such as Suhail Malik, who, who have been using this term a lot to describe contemporary art, um, is so invested in, a, in an ethos of indeterminacy um, and in, a, in an, a ferocious insistence on not being um, didactic, uh, not being um, something which could be, even for a split second, uh, mistaken with a political message, let alone propaganda. Um, because at the end of the day, contemporary art takes uh, uh, an astounding measure of pride in, uh, in its degrees of uh, separation from, from all of those things. And I think that to go there, this place that you're describing, um, would take a whole other ball game. It would take a... It's fantastic that we end here today, at this very point. Because uh, uh, I, I think everybody notices the fact that uh, our uh, admired curator friends, uh, the one thing they did not uh, speak of was that you know the end of their proposed century, as uh, a uh, member of the audience pointed out. And part of the reason may be that uh, the challenges that that uh, we now face do oblige us to find a very different language to the one that dominates not only in art, but also uh, uh, intellectual uh, life and history. Do you see, do you see uh, that, uh, uh, for instance, the kinds of things that we could identify in the 70s could in any way perhaps uh, uh, be uh, uh, useful tools for, for uh, uh, you know, answering or, or at the very least tackling uh, this very crucial challenge? Well, I, as I said, like this ritualistic repetition of history, which is coming out of vested uh, speed or something else, I don't see that it will be useful. I just see that uh, it would be useful to understand that we are keep repeating the same thing, that we are in a loop, we are in a, avatars in a sort of video game, uh, that it's, it's a game prescribed by not somebody else as a, as a conspiracy theory, it's prescribed by all of us, but it doesn't lead to anything, but that we keep playing until exhaustion. And maybe it's about time that we change the rules. I don't know how. <laughs> That's probably the perfect, That's the perfect phrase to end, end up with. So I, I find it fascinating that we, we end on uh, anthropocenic time, geological time, but here in planetary time, we've run out of it. Um, so will you please join me in thanking Oscar, Marina, and a very ill turd ad. He's been heroic, so thank you very much for not pulling out. Thank you.